Hello, Michelle. Hi. Hi there. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing really good. Thank you. How are you? Excellent. Uh, getting along. Getting along. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for taking out the time. Um, so there's there's plenty to talk about, and I thought maybe we'd talk about what you found uh, in these papers. Um, one yeah. was uh, the reduced transceiver delay, and the the other one looked like it was drilling down into details from Altera. So if you if if you want to uh, to to kind of go over what you found, because uh, it's very interesting the the result of of cutting the the latency by half. Uh, I think that's what it said. Yeah, sure. sure. Not, Maybe I'll just. Yeah, not, make sure I don't quote the quote it wrong, but I think it talked about a, a pretty significant um, additional uh, reduction in latency. And since we want to be a low latency system here, um, I thought that was that was really good. So so if you, if you want to talk about that, uh, uh, you have the floor. Sure. So this this paper, which, which I was reading um, on, mainly suggests about, of course, using the same F50 core for both the I50 and the F50 uh, computations, uh, so that essentially a transceiver, by not having two different IF50 and F50, it essentially uses only one F50 core by doing uh, one time DIT and one time GIF, that is decimation in time and frequency. And of course, it has its own flavors of bit reversed output at, uh, I mean, different configurations of bit reversed output according to the IF50 and F50 uh, transceiver design. And it also suggests specifically of using cyclic suffix uh, instead of cyclic prefix as to what we see in the general OFDM uh, theory. Any any time when we read about OFDM, it says about hey use cyclic prefix so that we could avoid the ISI intersymbol interference from multipath and so on. So, so but here if we want to implement cyclic prefix, we need to first store the you know the, the first few samples and then. Uh, we should essentially hold the whole frame in a buffer so that we copy the last few samples to the first. So essentially the copied portion is being kept onto the first, the, the beginning of the frame. And for this reason, uh, we, we should kind of hold the whole frame. So instead of cyclic suffix suggests that we copy the first part of the frame to the last portion of the frame. And by doing this, we don't need to, you know, completely hold the buffer for a longer period of time. And by doing this, we need lesser buffers. And I think, I think somewhere around there, it, there should be a figure uh, in in the paper where it says how that buffering operation is done. I think, I think using that, he says that, hey, you know what? By using lesser buffers, we have lesser power consumption, lesser memory access calls, uh, and and it will be more efficient. And it also specifically talks about uh, how the uh, pilots and zeros should be inserted and how the data should be mapped to successive uh, subcarriers instead of you know going for the immediate subcarrier. And by mapping the bit, the bit reversed outputs to, to successive subcarriers, we're essentially following a, a interleaving kind of pattern and, and as being you know uh, having a better performance for the frequency selective channel. Uh, and and I think it 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 speaks about more specifics, which which uh, kind of I think I felt I need to spend more time to once again go through it. Um, but yeah, I think I think uh, with this reference alters uh, uh, you know the o existing OFDM uh, design examples which are there. Uh, I thought if, whether it makes any sense to, for me to go through it or or if it's an overkill right now uh, because the whole team concentrating on different. Uh, examples of OFDM because you, Michelle, and others are working on the MATLAB generated OFDM and me uh, working on Altera's OFD, HDL OFDM. Does it, does it make any sense for me uh, to, to to concentrate or to spend my effort on this? Uh, what was a question which I had. Uh, so yeah, maybe, maybe you can, I can, I can get some guidance on that. Uh, yeah. Yes. I think that exploring this and, and getting uh, a, at least a simulation working would in order to compare to the simulation that we're building uh, for for the spec which uses things like cyclic prefix and uses uh, uh, IFFT block uh, you know 
with it it does use the bit reversal uh thing and that that does make a a, a difference just by itself so if you have what they call linear um ordering rather than the bit reversal style ordering then you you clearly see a, an improvement in in latency from that and then this is showing it looks like it's showing additional latency improvements and and not just from the cyclic suffix because that was something that kind of occurred to me while I was doing the cyclic prefix was I'm like well I have to wait you know until I get this entire you know 1024 thing that I'm that the output of the IFFT I have to wait all the way you know to the end and and then you know I have to prefix I have to get the last 82 samples and put it on the front and I'm like well that's going to delay it by however long it takes to gather up the 1024 plus however long it takes to manipulate this which isn't much but it's something so it 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 like it occurred to me like well, why why do we have to put it at the front so the cyclic suffix as far as i can tell that that still does that circular convolution trick as long as it's there so i guess the suffix is you you with the first 82 uh samples then get put on the end which means you're not having to wait until the end to put it back on the front it seems like that would that would be a, a sort a lowering of the latency at least a little bit by itself. So I was just thrilled when I read it in Slack and I was like, oh duh, that's a that seems like something that we should try. So I'm gonna say yes, if you're interested in in implementing this, uh and and then we we compare it. So it's like it's gonna be in it'll be a competition. Like who who can who which which one has the lower area usage which one has the lower you know efficiency uh which one lower latency that, you know, like look at all the costs and and compare it so if you're up for it then then yes i think this would be a, a fantastic thing to do okay sure i think uh i think maybe i, will, I would ex try to explore in that in that uh way of effort and try to implement it i, I think uh when, when i download the examples uh here I have three different folders of oh, demodulation, demodulation, and and, and there, there is another folder. Uh, and it and every folder comes with the MATLAB script to verify the Verilog, the, the VHDL scripts. Oh wow! Uh, I think it's well organized. Uh, and, and maybe I'll I'll try to maybe at least in the next one week or two weeks, maybe I'll try to uh, do some progress on that and and we'll update. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the fact that there's examples is uh and this is let's see i'm looking at it is this for it looks like they're targeting fortis is that the examples yeah, that you're talking fortis. about okay yes exactly but but i was thinking since uh Altera is acquired by intel and I, I don't know i thought a generic uh privado or something would work I, it um, should if they're the thing that will be very interesting to find out is in this example, does it have anything that assumes um, an architecture? So, and looking at the performance section of the of the AN503, say I can see that they're that they are kind of tailoring it a little bit for the architecture because they're talking about DSP blocks are 18 by 18, 40, and I think that Xilinx has a slightly different. They're going to have different numbers, but that may okay. just be a question of which um, which architecture you pick in the very beginning when you open your project. So if you open this project, it's going to have those selections already kind of picked for you. But it may just be a question of okay, I'd like to target Xilinx chips instead. But you know what? what I, but the first time through, don't change anything. Just see if you can get it to compile as is, and it should. Everything should work on. On Vivado, um, it looks like they included model sim as well, which is which is cool. Um, I'm looking back up through the design examples to see if they say what to use. Let's see, they want you to use Cordis software, but yeah, so a quarter, uh, so Vivado, I don't think it'll open up a, a an Altera program, but 
if you if you can't get a hold of Altera to, to test this out, then uh, then come back and talk to me and we'll see what we can do. Uh, worst case, we'd have to go get the source code, like you to somehow get the source code out of the project. Hopefully it's human readable and then build a project from scratch using just the source code. That's not the end of the world, but, but yeah, this is really exciting stuff. I, I, it, and it makes sense. And the way that you explained it and described it in Slack was really clear um, and very, very well, well, well stated. And I thought it was, yeah, it's interesting. The, the bit reversal thing um, also leveraged as an interleaver and that's that's cool because if that's the case and it's already if you can already do it just as a a part of the IFFT process or the 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 modulator process then then you can remove an extra step because interleaving also requires buffering up and I, I we have an interleaving section in the spec so you know anything that can remove uh, a stage or a step without removing the functionality would dramatically reduce the latency. So I think it's really exciting. This is exactly what we're supposed to be paying attention to. It'll it'll take some some getting in there and mucking around with whatever Altera likes to do for projects versus what Vivado likes to do for projects. Um, you know, but then again, maybe maybe we should go ahead and if this Altera Quartus 2 software version 7.2 or later is not free, then maybe we could um, you know, ask Altera for for help because uh, we're a nonprofit trying to learn and do professional development and educational stuff. So, and and maybe maybe having it in the in that family uh, is is just an additional way to kind of compare and to and to build capability in the community. So. I'll leave it up to you to see how easy that is, or if you can get it to compile, if you can get access to the software. And just over the next two weeks, I think that would be a, a huge step forward. Sure, Michelle, yeah. I, I think I'll, I'll try to do that. Thanks. Okay, yeah, and I'll I'll, I'll read through, I, I, I read through, I went over the two papers, um, and there was only a few things that I think I was still kind of hazy on or confused about so so i'll i'll dive in and and see what i can see what else i can learn um so it, they were they were pretty good the, the, they're not they're not terribly long which is fantastic it was like four pages but packed full of good stuff and then the the one uh from altera was a little longer but had great this is like really clear diagrams and stuff so that, that, was, that was a good find and uh, and really on target because what we want to do is have low latency. It, that's doing stuff like this, it, it will require kind of going back to uh, Andreas and Leonard and saying, you know, the specification is, it actually get, gets into sort of these implementation details at this level. It, it does say cyclic prefix. So if we can show that there's a significant advantage to the, to, to changing things around, then then that would mean then we would have to to go through a process of changing the specification, which I think would probably uh, be of great interest, especially since uh, since latency is the is the one thing that's that's what this is supposed to provide is a low latency uh, error corrected digital link to a drone, and uh, that's that's pretty key that. The, the desired number, which I don't remember off the top of my head for, for the latency is pretty short. So anything that we can do um, would would directly help. So that's that's what that's the longer term sort of task list would be. Okay, so here here it is working to spec and here it is with these improvements, but this would change this would re require a change in the specification. And that would be a conversation for for later to like you modify the spec, spec based on the research and development that, that you would be doing. Yeah, yeah, sure. All right. Any anything else? Have you found anything else or got anything else uh, going on that? that uh, I think I think uh, my from my task list uh, from the previous weeks. I think I have still not uh, worked on the MATLAB official uh, 
OFT and HTL examples. I, th I think that's one more thing. I think you know the other reference that which we had, which we wanted to explore, but I didn't do it. Maybe I think it's a, it's a simple, straightforward thing. I think just calling on the examples and seeing how it works. Maybe uh, when, when I have time, maybe I'll, I'll look on to that as well and see what we can learn from that. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm I, just I, a, I, I'm just a little bit ahead of you, really. The the HDL, oh, okay. the, those HDL OFDM examples are intimidating because they had. I, I think it was like seven layers of hierarchy to drill down to the point where I started recognizing anything. And there's a lot of, it's, there's a lot of like blocks that are, you mm -hmm. know, cause you can do sub assemblies or, or, you know, subsystems, sorry, subsystems and Simulink. And, and that's how, that's how we're doing it. We have one subsystem and that's the target for the HDL coder. And the rest of it is a test bench, you know, stuff that doesn't have to be, yeah. HDL coder compatible and, you know, that's doing stimulus or, and checking the response. But the, so I cracked open the HDL OFDM examples and then got pretty intimidated. It was, so I, there was stuff that I couldn't figure out what it was doing and there's lots of acronyms. So I'm not, I was, I was kind of expecting, um, I think something a lot more hardware looking. <laughs> Because <laughs> you know, it was a, supposed to be an HDL coder targeted system. And I'm like, oh, so I, it's very, very uh, systemy. And uh, so I, I don't know. I think spending more time with it would be good once, like, especially for somebody like me. This is really the first time I've worked with OFDM. And, and I'm learning now a lot of the LTE stuff. And there's lots and lots of acronyms and lots of fields and moving parts so you know i think we'll, we'll get back to it we'll we get, we'll come back to the their examples their published examples and see if there's something in there um that can help and i i think at this point because i've had kind of an unexpected amount of difficulty in trying to get that agc burst and the preamble a and the preamble b inserted so i'm up to the point where i think i've got good data i've got the cyclic prefix i've got data i've got you know, symbols uh, going out at 20 kilohertz rate. Uh, there was, I got the rate harmonized between the input and the output and, and, and all that. And I'm like, okay, now is the time to, if I have a push to talk signal. So I set up a push to talk signal. When you hit push to talk, when you start the transmission, it starts out with that AGC burst, which is really pretty cool. It's a Zadoff Chu sequence. And I learned about those and got it all, you know, calculated. Um, and then we found an interesting thing in the in, with with respect to the specification and and how long it should be. So uh, so plenty of good work there. But I'm like, okay, so now all I need to do is play it once at the beginning of a transmission. So push to talk signal comes in, AGC burst goes out, then preamble A, then preamble B, and then the data. So this doesn't seem like it would be too hard. Um, but when you bring in a symbol or bring in a value from, from the workspace, so I calculate the AGC burst in, in MATLAB, and I bring it into the workspace, and I present it as a constant to the Simulink, and it just wants to keep playing it over and over and over again, like it plays continuously. So I want it to trigger, and I want it to transmit once, and then I want other stuff to take over, and then, you know, because it's a resource grid. I spent all day yesterday when I wasn't working on, when I wasn't at work, uh, trying to figure out how this design pattern works in Simulink, and it, it so far baffled me. So I've got triggered subsystem and enabled subsystem, and then just the just the, the constant running all the time. Um, and I know there's got to be a way to do this. And so I found at late in the, late in the evening, finally found a couple of web pages. Use, you know, just using the right Google keywords, that's really the game here. I found a couple of web pages that look like it might be, I might be able to do this with a data store. Because in real hardware, I think it would be some small bit of ROM, you know, and, and you go and you tap that ROM and put those values out on the transmitter when you hit push to talk. So that's, that's what it should look like. But I'm just trying to get Simulink to, to present that, to, to stand for that. And, uh, and so far, I've gotten close, uh, but not, not quite. Um, 
so that that's that's where I'm at on that. And the other, you know, so I'm I'm writing up a, a so some documentation, I'm writing up a little document for the Zadoff Chu stuff, and I have some pretty good visualizations. I think I even have it open here. Let me see if I can track it down on on the screen share. Do, 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 do. There it is. Okay, so here it is in in Scrivener. And I have a, a brief introduction. So this is, oh no, this is the wrong one. This is for the space frequency block coding. Okay, well, I can talk about that too. So uh, trying to write up a document about the space frequency block coding, which I think uh, I now I now understand at least the transmit side, and I'm about to do the same uh, diagram, same diagram style uh, for the uh, for the receiver. Oh, it doesn't. Oh, I am screen sharing the the right one. Let's see if I can make it move. Oh, there we go. Okay, so yeah, here's the AGC burst document, and I I start out with like defining what the Zadoff Chu sequence is and wh who we are, why people should care. And then talk about the leading edge of the Neptune transmission is automatic gain control burst. Um, and then I talk about the design, which right now is here, it's set up in MATLAB. So it's in our workspace. And I point to the OFDM.M file. And then this is a section that does the AGC burst. Uh, and then I go through and have figures that show this is this is I think I posted these also to Slack, but it it's a it's been it's been a whole lot of learning and this this stuff's really cool. This is much better than the Walsh Hadamards uh, that I'm familiar with. So used for this is a sequence of numbers that auto correlates with itself at one position and is zero everywhere else but is and, and there's there's lots of sequences that do that but like this one's cool because it's constant amplitude so it's easy on your on your pa and that's what it actually looks like that's that's a chunk this first hundred things of this uh it's a, you know so it's a it's a it's a sequence and and you say okay how long do i want the sequence to be what what root index do i use it produces this uh, this sequence of numbers, and sure enough, this matched up with what you see in Wikipedia. Uh, and then this is what it looks like after it is mapped. Uh, and this is for I think the IFFT input side. Um, so you notice that the center is zeros. So we map half of it to one side, half of it to the other, and you either leave the zero tone unmapped or you puncture it in. In Andreas's code in the Python model, he punctures. So he maps it from the very first position, which is zero in zero based indexing is zero. And in MATLAB, that would be one. So he just maps that like 444 and then punctures one, like removes it, zeroes it out. And so I missed that because when I see unmapped, I think that that's unmapped. It's kept zero and you start at the next position. So we had a open question to open up a question to Andreas about about which one to do. And then the last figure here uh, is the actual AGC burst. So this is the, in our case, 110 samples long. In order to get to five microseconds at the rate that we're actually running at the transmitter, which is 1106 instead of 1024 because of the cyclic, addition of the cyclic prefix, then it has to be 110 and not 102 like in this spec. So that's another uh, issue that, that we'll describe and file to kind of tighten up the specification because it's if you specify 102 samples and you're running at a faster rate then you're it won't make 100 it won't make five microseconds it'll be less than that now that may not matter 102 to 110 <laughs> but but it, i don't want to be out of spec and and when the looking at the specification it talks about a clock rate of 20.48 megahertz that only is a that only is applicable if you have 1024 samples in your symbol, but at transmit, that's 1106. So that's that. Um, and I don't 
I know I have screenshots of the, the design itself, like the updated uh, Simulink around here somewhere, but I'd have to rummage pretty hard. Uh, but so what I'll do is I'll do a little walkthrough of, of these and other screenshots um, about like trying to get the AGC burst in there and and all the other stuff I've learned. Um, I think I may need that may be behind in capturing the screenshots. So so anyway, there's I'll just have to promise to uh, to put together a, a quick video um, about that. And then Ken, hello Ken, any questions or comments for us about Neptune? You can sort of see what we're up to here. No, yep, just uh, following along. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, if you see anything along the way that uh, got any advice or, or feedback. Um, and then the space frequency block coding, we did get a, a clarification back on that. The space frequency block coding stuff is at the transmitter. It's a MIMO or MISO, really, multiple input, single output or MISO technique. We have two transmit antennas, one receive antenna. And the idea here is, is it actually isn't that bad. It, it, it is like, that's a lot of words, space and frequency and block coding. <laughs> but it's just use two antennas to get your space diversity because you're trying to defeat multipath here. OFDM is, is all about that. And if you have two antennas in two different places in space that are separated, then the paths that those antennas are uh, are presenting are going to be different. So you have diversity in space. You also have diversity in frequency because there's two subcarriers. And then the block coding part is you take pairs of your samples and you take the complex conjugate. In, in one case, the complex conjugate, and the other, the negative complex conjugate, and then you swap sides. So you go from two transmitted symbols to four, they're in parallel, so you're not changing your rate. And so I, I drew a diagram. It's adapted from a diagram I found. Um, and then I'm, I'm, I walk through, uh, you know, why you want to do this. And then, you know, I, I try to make it, I tried really hard to make it understandable. Like if it's a train track. So you have train cars going down a track. You come to a Y intersection. You evenly divide your train, every other train car down each of the two new tracks. And then, okay, on the other side, when you receive this mess, the, the next part of this paper is, well, why would you want to do this? And then going through the, you know, it's a little bit of a matrix, uh, matrix multiplication, and it does make your signal more resilient. And then, yeah, the, the and then showing the HDL coder ready Simulink design is going to be the implementation part. So that's... That's still kind of, I've, I've tried to explain the transmitter side for space frequency block coding, and then still have to describe the math on the receiver, and then talk about an implementation, which is not really, not done yet. Uh, but I think I see how to do it. So you, you know, splitting up the the samples, that's, that's doable. Um, and then performing a, a complex conjugate, and then placing those uh, and we'll be able, we'll be using both of the transmitters on the ADRV 9002. So we're we're lab ready. We have the right hardware. Um, on the receive side, I'm not really sure yet how to test this over the air. Um, so we'll we'll have to figure that out. Hopefully, Andreas will help with that. He's been Andreas Farsinger has been working on a receiver, um, and we should too because Andreas's will not be open source. He's, he's doing a, a closed uh, implementation of this. And we might be able to talk him into sharing it at some point, maybe, uh, but we honor the uh, the work that people want to do and, and publish as much as we can. So publishing this, all this transmitter stuff is a big, huge step forward, um, including any of the R&D things that we can do for it. And, and showing the process for through HDL Coder has been a, interest to a lot of people. So that's the status on that. And oh, the, yeah, the, the space frequency block coding is used to improve signal 
uh, resiliency to improve things in um, in LTE. So, but there's also space time block coding, and there's also there's a, there's at least one other strategy to do uh, redundancy uh, of the style, like a MISO style. Um, so, from an R and D perspective, space frequency block coding looks like it's uh, the right thing to to start out with, and it's also the one that's 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 required in the specification. But several folks on Mastodon were, were asking like, do you really need this for a drone? Because on a drone, the two antennas are gonna be pretty close. So the space diversity, is it really enough of an advantage to to really justify this on a platform like, like a drone? Um, and so I think we should go ahead and as soon as we get the space frequency block coding thing set up and working, as per the spec for the frequencies that we're talking about, for the data rates that we're talking about, that we go ahead and run a bunch of channel models through it from LTE. So the urban, extended urban environment probably is a good one to use because I would imagine drones flying around large buildings or buildings of any urban type might be a use case. Um, and also, you know, since it's moving, the, the Doppler stuff comes into the, the model as, as well. Um, but as soon as we can, it'd be good to prove that you need space frequency block coding. If not, then we can drop back to one antenna with no loss and with just losing complexity and cost. So Andreas says, yes, the, this technique will help on a drone at these frequencies. And, and other people have gone, have asked, really? That's, that's interesting. We'd like to see, you know, you show your work. And I was like, of course, we, uh, that sounds fun. And there are models for LTE. These models from from the from the mobile world, the, they exist in um, in in toolboxes that we have access to. So we can make a system model that is the channel models for LTE and feed that into a simulation, and then say, okay, does it does it have, what's the advantage? Um, and I think that will be that'll be super fun. So we'll we'll get to we'll get to do that when we when we come when we come to a point where the the space frequency block coding stuff is working. All right, I think that's all I have. Any anything else? Mm, not for me. Sorry. Okie dokie. Well, thank you so much, everybody. This is uh. Uh, the learning curve is certainly uh, steep, but it's been it's been really um, not just fun, but kind of like a, a rewarding in the sense that it's like, oh, this is stuff that's actually used out there in the world, and and getting a chance to compare, contrast, you know, put things against each other, pick the best thing forward, and and feedback to a specification is um, well, it's really good work. So it's uh, really looking forward to this. I I don't have a good sense for schedule, but the uh, I would really like to demonstrate this in August at at DEF CON, and assuming that we go to microwave update in uh, October, that this would be of great interest. Um, August will literally be here before you know it. That's just the way that time works. Um, but we and we are and. So there is an update here about DEF CON. Uh, DEF CON was canceled. Uh, this, this is a long-standing sort of joke or prank that, that we play in the community and have for 32 years. But this year, it was literally canceled. This just happened a few days ago. Um, Caesars Forum um, is where we've had DEF CON for a number of years now. And the Caesars Forum people canceled the contract. Uh, which is pretty unheard of for large conference to get a, get canceled seven months out. But the uh, DEF CON folks moved to the Las Vegas Convention Center. This is a pretty big move and uh, means that all of the plans for floor space and villages and demos need to be updated and changed. And they will be. So we are in Radio Frequency Village um, and we may but we we've have had interest from aerospace village and neptune really kind of fits in with aerospace village uh really well so there 
we may have a high fria it in uh, our village we may have everything high fria and neptune and whatever else in our village or we might split split up if we can get enough staff to cover two villages that would be fantastic because uh, neptune really does it would really be um it would fit right in an aerospace village so we still have <laughs> we definitely still have space in rf village but we have no idea what the space will look like uh we the way that we do demonstrations is we just need a table and we bring all of our own stuff and i think we just need power so in the past uh we've we've shown all sorts of places and we're confident that we can make it work this time around uh but yeah a little bit of fruit basket turnover there not not what we were expecting to have happen uh but we definitely still have space in august and it's a great place to show the crowd is uh fantastic and we'll we will have many thousands of people see it and the, the bonus about everything being together in one place rather than spread out over uh, three or more uh, hotel conference centers is that at, at being in one place at the Las Vegas Convention Center means everybody at DEF CON can see all the villages by walking around under one roof. And we have not been able to do that at DEF CON for a very long time. So that may increase the foot traffic by, by quite a bit. So that's the update for for shows, um, and I, do, I don't have confirmation back yet from Microwave Update if they are going to have a demo room. Uh, I got the impression that we were asking for the details uh, maybe a little too early for for a conference in October, uh, but I made it really clear that we'd love to be that we'd love to show and and take up uh, one or more tables in their demonstration room. All right, so that's all the news that I have, and I will. I'll see you all on Slack. Thank you so much. And if anybody is following along with the meeting and wants to get involved, then please go to our website at openresearch.institute and you'll see a getting started link. And that's the first step to, to getting, getting in and getting on board. Um, and we have lots of resources for you if you want to do open source digital design. All right, see, see everybody on Slack and see you next week.